Well, in the fourth century AD, the great Roman Empire was crumbling, and persecution against Christians was increasing. As a result, many believers fled Rome and lived in caves and tents in the desert. They were destitute, they had rags for clothes, they had very little food. Well, among those Christians in the fourth century came one man with a rather novel idea. He went to the ruins of a large building and discovered a pillar, a pillar that was 60 feet tall. He somehow managed to construct a crude ladder. He climbed to the top, kicked the ladder away, and history reports that he lived for the next 30 years continuously on top of that pillar. Now, if you wonder how he survived up there for all that time, he had taken a, a string or a rope with him, and from time to time, people would come by, and he would lower the string, and they would attach a chicken leg or whatever, and he would pull it back up, and that, that's how he remained up there. Well, believe it or not, this became sort of a fad among the early Christians. Others began to claim an abandoned pillar here or there, and somehow got to the top, and then would just live there the rest of their lives. And they came to be called the Pillar Saints. Now, in a way, you certainly have to respect their desire to escape the influence of this sinful world and give their full concentration to their relationship with God. However, the pillar saints seem to somehow overlook one of the absolutely essential dimensions of Christianity, and that is other people. From the very beginning of creation, God designed that life would be lived at its fullest when there are two types of relationships, a vertical relationship between us and God, and then horizontal relationships between us and other people. In fact, Jesus one time summarized this vertical and horizontal concept this way. He said, all of the commandments in the Bible can be synthesized into this. Love God and love other people. And that's where the pillar saints really missed the mark. They had the vertical relationship nailed, but they obviously graded out pretty low in the, in the horizontal relationship department. Well, as we continue our series, Building Better Relationships, today our focus is on the benefits of community. And in just a moment, some people are going to come up here and share their seeker stories. The first, you know, when you think about it, those of us who are not pillar saints, because if we were, we wouldn't be here right now. We'd be sitting on top of a pole somewhere. But for the rest of us that are not pillar saints, our lives are made up of a network of relationships. Maybe you have a spouse. Maybe you have parents that are still living. Maybe you have kids that are at home, or maybe they're somewhere else and they're grown. You have relationships with coworkers, maybe roommates, maybe in-laws and relatives, probably friends, maybe customers and clients, people at school, people at work, people you play sports with or your kids play sports with. Lots and lots of relationships for most of us. So one thing to think about today is how are you managing those relationships? You know, I think we all know that, you know, when we're getting along well with other people and interact with other people, it just makes things in our lives better. We feel better, life is more enjoyable. However, when the relationships in our lives are difficult or distant or deteriorating, we just kind of walk around with a knot in our gut, and life lost, loses a lot of its joy. But God did not create us to live as lone rangers or pillar saints. He created us to live in community with some other people. So, let me ask you, how are your relationships going these days? Is there any room for improvement in your relationship with your husband or wife, your kids, your parents, maybe an ex even, maybe people in the church, extended family and relatives, someone you work with, any room for improvement with anyone in your life? Well, before some people come up, I want to just mention a few things from Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that talk about some of the rewards of relationships. For instance, verse 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Reward number one, strong relationships create synergy. Now, it was during the 80s that this word synergy was coined, and it described the coming together of separate forces or energies and synthesize them together into one. Well, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, was obviously familiar with the concept of synergy, the dynamic that develops in positive and productive relationships. A strong marriage relationship results in synergy. A strong work relationship 
has synergy. A strong sense of team or family in a church creates or results in synergy. Two are better than one. Reward number two, strong relationships provide support. In verse 10, it says, if one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the person who falls and has no one there to help them. You know, after doing this for 40 years, I think one of the great tragedies of life that I have seen is when someone goes through a major life crisis, some devastating event in their life, and they find that they don't really have anybody else. Maybe their family is fractured, maybe their friendships are not that solid, and they wind up not having anybody to receive much strength or support from. And suffering or sorrowing in solitude can be really difficult, as some of us can experience, can attest from experience. But when you have some significant close relationships, even just one or two, you find you don't have to suffer, you don't have to sorrow all alone. Reward number three, strong relationships provide a sense of security. Solomon writes, if two lie down together, uh, will, if two lie down together, they will be warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. When you have someone in your life that you know will stand behind you no matter what, it gives you an inner sense of confidence. It provides sort of a bubble of security or safety. When verse 11 talks about two lying down together, I don't think this is necessarily referring to physical intimacy as much as emotional intimacy or closeness. And when there's a strong emotional bond between you and somebody else, whether it be a parent and a child, a husband and a wife, friends, you know, whatever, when there's a strong emotional bond, that relationship provides a sense of refuge, a place of security and safety. Ecclesiastes 4 tells us that strong relationships create synergy, provide support, and also security. And of course, there are other benefits and rewards that come our way through relationships, and we're talking about that over the course of the series. But today, we're going to hear from a few people from right here in our church family. And the first person you have seen her around the church for many, many years, uh, working in the cafe and the potluck, she has done that for uh, a decade or more. And so I want you to welcome to the stage Terry Pantel today. Could you not get a short duel? This is the this is the one we got. At the, we got it at the garage sale, so you know. Oh, you can do it. Maybe. I bet you're taller than my mom was at the end. She used to be like 5'8", and she turned out to be like 4'7", at the end, you know. But Well, I, I thought I'd ask Terry first, because some of you, you don't know her as well as, as others of us do. But tell us how it was that you first came to the church. I was an aunt to three wonderful boys, Robin's boys, mm -hmm. and we would go to movies. That was our thing. So one day, Robin says, why don't you come to church? And we'll go to lunch, and then you can go to the movies with boys. So I did. And I kept coming. That's why I picked the boys up <laughs> on Sundays to go to movies. I told Robin after the first one that if we could get Max to come, he would love it. We got him to come to an Easter service at the Catholic Center, and he never not came <laughs> again. <laughs> So we moved a couple of times. We couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> they wouldn't give him the new address. <laughs> he still found it. <laughs> but that's how we became closer, he and I. We knew something was missing. At that point, we'd been married maybe 10 years and had never gone to church. We both believed in God. We talked about it. But we never got up on Sunday morning. So this gave us a reason to get up. And, uh, you know, we got to know you guys. And, and uh, Max, you guys served uh, with Mary and, and, and homeless uh, people in Oklahoma City oh, yeah. for a while. And many other things. Max, just like you, had a servant's heart. And, 
And then uh, a few years ago, you went through a difficult situation where, where you lost Max. Tell, tell us about that. That was the hardest thing I've ever been through. I found him dead in the garage. And as strong as I am, this almost broke me. But the minute I called anybody in this church, they were at my house, except for Russ and Jana, who I couldn't get a hold of. <laughs> we would have been there. They did not have their phone on that morning. <laughs> Neither one of them had their phone on. <laughs> that may have been actually better. But once, once I got a hold of them, Jana was at my house. I had more food than we could ever eat from this church. I had more support from this church. Max died on Friday, and I walked into church Sunday morning and was just enveloped with love and support. You guys got me through. Well, Max was, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a real churchy guy, even even when he, you know, found a God. Never saw him in a suit, did you? He never did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of his uh, his favorite bands ever was Leonard Skinner. And uh, probably uh, six months or so before he passed away, they were at the Zoo Amphitheater. And so I bought two tickets so they could go see okay. Leonard Skinner, and he said it was an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and, see and he out. wasn't even drinking that night. <laughs> he wasn't Sorry. drinking. He, was <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought that was just the most marvelous thing that had happened to him. And then a few weeks later, Sarah had tickets to Neil Diamond, so I thought that was the best thing that ever <laughs> So we were both happy that month. Yeah. Well, uh, I know recently you've been uh, going through some uh, health issues, and uh, probably most people here are, are not aware of that one. Give them a little update on that so they have a, a sense of what's going on. Getting old is not the golden years. <laughs> it is the doctor years, the emergency clinic years. <laughs> Lots of prescription years. In December, I've always had some problems, but in December, I started feeling horrible. I started losing weight. I started running a fever every day. It took us eight weeks to figure out what was going on, and it was more than just one thing. Uh, we've worked through all of it. The one major thing I have left to do is two knees. We'll do one this summer and probably one the first of the year. But it's it's a challenge when you're alone not to feel good. I mean, my house was filthy. <laughs> so Christmas was not a fun time this year. But every day I every Sunday I came to church I would feel the love surround me, always. You know, situations like this are people that we, that we love and who serve behind the scenes and, and have contributed so much. I know you guys have gotten a lot out of the church, but you guys oh. have given probably more than you've gotten out of it. And it's situations like this where, you know, if she goes through a knee surgery or knee replacement or whatever. It'll be a knee replacement, uh, two knee that's replacements. That's difficult. I know Tina's had that. Some of you understand that, and that's difficult. So uh, we don't want to just envelop people like this with love when they show up on Sunday, uh, but when they can't, you know. And uh, some of us who know different people well enough need to step in in situations like that. And because my that. concern is my first two weeks out of surgery, my chihuahua is not going to help me. <laughs> she is no help when I don't feel good other than she can lay on my lap. So, so, you know, these are things that when you're a couple, you don't worry about. But. Oh, no. 
No, 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 no. You can come over. <laughs> Megan can come over. Even Michael can come over. What? <laughs> I don't have that gift. Whatever that gift is when people are, you know, in bad shape, I, I don't have that gift. When I had the blood clot, he, he did come to the hospital to see me and laughed at me. <laughs> I don't remember that. I was oh, yeah. To, I was trying to make you feel better. You know, the hair was bad, no makeup. <laughs> But he did come. I was impressed. Let's end on that note right there. Let's hear it for Terry. <laughs> Let's hear it for Terry. She said something good about me. Thanks, Terry. All right. Well, a number of months ago, I introduced you to the next person who's going to come up, Christine Cooper. I told you she had been in my youth ministry back in the early 80s, and she had gone on to become a, a doctor, and she delivered many, many, many babies and did all kinds of things as a female girly doctor, whatever. <laughs> They're I, called uh, obstetricians. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then she was diagnosed with uh, cancer, and so she had to sort of retire. And I told you I ran into her last year, about this time right now, actually, at rehab over there. I was rehabbing my shoulder, and she was trying Physical to therapy. Physical therapy. Rehab. Let's make that clear. <laughs> was, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. She was, <laughs> and I, she said, I, are you Rusty Martin? And I said, yes. And she, That's incorrect. What he oh, said yeah. was, I don't go by Rusty anymore. That's <laughs> actually I, what he I said. I don't remember that, but I did say that probably. Totally. And she said, I'm Christine Cooper. And, of course, she had short hair, and I hadn't seen her for 25 years. I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. And I said, what are you doing here? And she goes, well, I have terminal cancer. And I was like, wow. I hadn't seen her in all that time and didn't know where she had been since she were 15 or 16. And, uh, and so she got up here, I don't know, six months ago and, and kind of told everybody her, her, her story. And I, I asked her to come up today. Just to give a, a, a quick update, and then and then talk talk to her about one more thing. So I mean, you look you look fine, and you 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 seem like you have plenty of energy, and like everything is great. But why don't you give us the inside scoop of, of what's uh, what's really going on with you health wise? Okay, um, I actually just had a new scan last week and new labs, and I am currently in remission, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Every, uh, every three months I, I get that done, and every three months so far it's been a relief. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't, I, my prognosis is poor, but that's not where I live, and that's not what I focus on. And I get up every day and just move forward. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, I was really glad when Russ asked me if I would talk a little bit today about community because... It was so bad when I was going through my chemo and, and recovering from my surgery, and I had so much time to think all the time about what matters. You know, when you're facing such, such a terrible thing, um, it, take, it, it focuses your mind on things that really matter in your world. And, um, you know, I don't think that it was just serendipity that we ran into each other. And <clears throat> I think if, if those of you who were here and heard me speak last time, you know, when I walked through those doors and I heard the music and, and stayed for that, that service that first time, I cannot tell you how I just felt like I was home. This was where I belonged. This is where I am. And so I, I just want to talk to you kind of how I think of community a little differently now. Um, you know, I think when most of us think of community, it brings all kinds of things to mind. It could be um, a religion that you're born into, the city that you were born into. Um, nowadays, it, social media is a whole community that many of us are a part of. Um, it, it can mean a lot of different things. For me, it is also not just about having things in common, because I think when we think of community, we think people who think like we do, people who do things that we do, 
And that is a part of it. But I very much see this church, our church, all churches, but I'll focus on this church, as a community that is not necessarily people who are completely like-minded. I think we all have a, um, our base, our our base is is our faith. But I really believe it is the relationships that we have with people that are what forms the bonds and the strength that makes us a community. And <clears throat> this, you know, in listening to what Terry was talking about, um, there are not words to tell you how important it is when people feel so isolated, in, in Terry's case, in my case, by a health problem. But it can be so many different things. There's no one in this room that has been able to escape um, pain. Um, and there are all different forms of isolation. I, I can't tell you the importance of having a community like our church here and the role that we all play in, in helping everyone in this room, people who are very different from us, uh, people who we may only see once a week, but I don't think we should ever underestimate the importance of the bonds that we have here with people and how it makes us stronger um, in so many ways. And I don't think we should take that for granted. And, and I hope that other people can recognize the importance of having that in your life. And I don't want you to have to have a, a horrible health scare or, or really dramatic things happen in your world to recognize that importance. And I was thinking today about things that I would like to encourage many of us to consider how we can strengthen our bonds within this church. Um, the potluck is a great example today of things that will bring people together. Something to consider is maybe sitting with people today that you don't know, that you've not met. Um, we tend to all sit with our, you know, our families and, and you know, people we, we know and like. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would encourage everyone to consider maybe meeting somebody different today or somebody that you know, but you'd like to know a little bit better out, outside of potentially just that you know them as someone who comes to church. There are many of you out there I know. I have no clue what you do for a living. I don't know what your homes are like. I don't know your children, your grandchildren. I don't know what your world is like when, when you leave here. And I would like to know more about you. So when I approach you, don't think that I'm too weird. Um, <laughs> no, but it, it is something that I, I do encourage us. And I think it's also important for growth of a church is that as a church family, we get to know the people outside of our church community. Um, I also think that it, another important thing that we do is like the Habitat for Humanity that's coming up. You know, my mom said to me, I was like, hey, we've got the Habitat for Humanity coming up. And mom was like, uh, no. <laughs> and, and I said, no, really? And she's like, I would only hurt somebody or hurt myself. <laughs> you know, I, I, I encourage people to also get out of your comfort zone. And, and do things like that. Um, I love the bridges thing that Jana brought into our world about taking care of young individuals that don't have family support. Um, I could go on and on and on, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that I feel like we have the resources in, of the people in this room to make our church a better place, but to make the world a better place by the things that we do. But I think it's going to start by knowing each other. Um, if I had my way, we would all have name tags because I can't remember anybody's name. But um, I hope that that makes sense 
to people and that rings true for people all of you are important to me and i'm glad you're here and i'm so glad that i'm here um i'm very thankful for you all every every week you know i still have a lot um ahead of me in terms of my my health stuff you know i'm gonna go through ups and downs and um thank you all for for being here for me so thanks christy appreciate yeah. it well, we have uh, another couple. So this is going to be our last ones today that uh, have been around here for quite a long time, really, but they maintain a pretty low profile. So I'll bet that very few of you uh, have any idea of the full story behind uh, their lives that they've been living for a while and so they have agreed today to come up and, and share some of that with you so let's welcome to the stage Jason and Kelly Dotson Well, Russ is right. We're pretty private people. We don't talk a lot about our lives, but we're very thankful to have the opportunity today to tell you about our family. Before I get started, I would like to say happy birthday to my mom, Judy, in the back. She's the best mom in the world that I could have ever asked for. I wish I could be half the mom that you've been to me. Um, so Jay and I started dating in 1999. We started coming to church immediately together way back when it was at Boyd and Barry. And we've been a little inconsistent since, and we'll explain why, but it was very important to us to go to church together and to have a family that believed in God and, and worshiped God together. So we got married in 2001, and our son, Stephen, was born in 2003, and he's over there. Wave hi, Stephen. <laughs> he's the best son that we ever could have asked for. He is intelligent and caring and kind. We just love him so much. In 2004, our daughter Katie was born. Wave hi, Katie. <laughs> and so we had our little boy and our little girl, and they were happy and healthy, and she was so fun-loving, and we just thought that our lives were going to be perfect and blessed, and um, that all changed the day of her six-month immunizations. And on that day, she had a seizure that lasted almost two hours in the emergency room at Norman Regional. They could not stop it. And so she was too um, unstable to even be medified out to Children's Hospital. And so there was nothing we could do. Since that time, to make a long story short, she's had thousands of seizures. She's been on 25 different medications. None of them have worked. There's nothing left in the world to try for her. So she's been through four specialists. And in 2011, they determined that the best thing for her would be to try brain surgery. And so we agreed to it. We went down to Texas, and they took out the size of an orange from her right occipital lobe. It left her blind in the left half of both eyes and with a whole lot of sensory problems. But within two weeks, her seizures had started again. So she didn't get any relief from that. And later that year, they implanted a VNS in her arm, and it's sort of like a pacemaker for your brain. Uh, that didn't help either. So at that point, there was nothing left to try, and we were very hopeless. Um, we found out later that year that she has a genetic disorder called Dravet syndrome, and it's the most catastrophic form of epilepsy that there is. But getting this diagnosis at least explained a lot about her life. Um, she never sweats, and when she gets overheated or excited in any way, she has seizures. She has developmental delays and walking issues. Um, it, it just explained a lot to be able to have that diagnosis. She also has a compromised, compromised immune system, which is why for a while we just we withdrew. To, to be honest, I was a little angry with God. We, we stopped going to church because of germs, and we were afraid she would get sick. Um, she's had pneumonia many, many times in her life. And so we were just, we lost all hope. Until 2013, we were watching TV together, and there was a TV show called Weed, and Dr. Sanjay Gupta was talking about this little girl named Paige, or Charlotte, um, in Colorado, and she had Dravet syndrome just like Katie, 
and she was being treated with CBD oil, which is from, derived from the hemp plant. So this little girl was seeing amazing results seizure-wise and developmentally, and we thought, we have got to try this for our child, but it was illegal here in Oklahoma. So we had a huge decision to make, and that's where community comes in. Um, we could move to Colorado and try the medication for her, but the community here in Norman has been our whole lives. Um, we've lived in the same house since we got married. Our children have gone to the same schools. All of our friends and neighbors and family are here, and everyone who knows Katie loves her. They don't judge her. Um, she has so many friends at school. Uh, my parents, Jean and Judy Cryer, started coming to church with us here. And we just couldn't leave all that to move to Colorado. And I also have a quick story about Russ. He may not even remember, but he, years ago, um, called our house and offered to babysit Katie anytime. And it, it, <laughs> we may still take you up on that. But it meant so much to us. It just stayed with us forever that he would even offer. Because, you know, seizures are scary. And except for my parents, we don't have babysitters. So we don't ever get to um, go out and just be a couple. Except when my, when my parents help. Thank goodness we have them. So anyway, that just always stuck with us about how important it was and how special it was he would do that for us. Um, so what we did is we decided that instead of moving to Colorado, we were going to fight to get CBD oil legalized here in Oklahoma. So Jay's brother is a state representative. He authored a bill, and he called it Katie's Law. And uh, we really pushed through the Senate and the House, and we got the bill passed in 2015. Oh, oh, I forgot a little bit about the community. <laughs> um, the community, that's us at the Capitol. Sorry, I was just looking at the pictures. We were fighting for um, Katie and Cayman's Law is what it came to be known as. But also in the community, um, Katie was able to have a Make-A-Wish. She was able to meet Baker Mayfield. Um, I think her dad was a little bit more excited about that than <laughs> she was. <laughs> But she got to play football in the front yard with him. She almost knocked him out with the ball. She threw it so hard, but it was very <laughs> exciting. And um, what else is she? She's gotten to do Special Olympics every year. And um, there are just so many exciting, fun things that have come our way. Um, and through tragedy, you know, you get to see who your true friends are and what your church does for you and the family and people that you love. So we've been very blessed. So in 2015, um, Katie and Cayman's Law passed, and we gave Katie the oil immediately, and the results were, some were almost instantaneous. Um, before the oil, she was on five different medications a day, and she was like a zombie. Uh, if you asked her her name, she couldn't tell you. If you asked her what school she went to or what grade, she didn't have an answer. She had quit reading. She could hardly walk. Um, and then within a year's time, we were down to two medications for her. And she's talking, she's reading, she's learning. She's like a different child. There's her handwriting. It's kind of hard to see. But at the top is how she used to write. She couldn't even form words at all. And then at the bottom, it says, this is how I write now. And it's just such a huge difference. It's one of the visual things that we have to show how much this medication is helping her. So we're continuing to fight for everyone to be able to use this medicine in the state of Oklahoma. It's given our lives a purpose. So. <laughs> you want me to tell it or not tell it? Okay, we have one quick, you're going to make me say this. Okay, we have, I have one very quick um, story. When we were, we were sort of lost and at our wits' end, and we went to a Bible group, and it was broken. There were probably 80 people in the group, and it was broken into tables with 10 people um, at each table, and the word of the day was healing. And so I just knew that God was going to answer my prayer for Katie, and I knew that we were going to get a Bible verse about healing, and then the group of um, 10 people would present it to everyone. So I was waiting for my answer. I knew in my heart that God was going to tell us how Katie was going to be healed. So we got the um, Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and, it said, and it's about the Apostle Paul who suffered from physical problems, and he asked God three times, I believe, Russ. He asked God three times for healing, and God never healed him. And so it says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I didn't really understand what all that meant. So I looked at the bottom where it explains the Bible to you. And it said at the very bottom that it was thought that the Apostle Paul suffered epilepsy and that God never healed him. So eventually Paul came to accept it. And I realized, I mean, it was tragic to, for me to hear that and to know that God was speaking directly to me. But it was also, it gave me such a great sense of peace that her illness is so much more than what I can comprehend on earth and that God has a plan for her and we just don't know it. So there have been many, many good things and the healing of other children and families that have come out of Katie and Cayman's law and her being sick. And I just believe, you know, sometimes we don't know why God does things to us, but there's a purpose. And if we believe God and we love him, then we have to believe that also. That's all. <laughs> you know, uh, when we uh, get out of ourselves a little bit and do what Christy was talking about and we get around and I don't know if my mic's on there. Okay. Um, you know, get out of our comfort zone and our little holy huddle of people we hang out with, whether it's just at this church or anywhere else. Uh, we would have the opportunity to meet people right here in our church family, sitting maybe right on the road from you, and you have no idea what they've been through or what's happening in their life, and sometimes it is just stuff like that that is just, it just blows your mind, you know? It just is amazing what people are, are facing, and uh, these guys have faced it uh, so so bravely, and for a long time, and even now, even some, they'll just, only one of them can come, and the other one, you know, stays home and, and so forth. And, uh, but, you know, it, it, your life could be blessed so much by occasionally just getting out of your comfort zone a little bit and just going around and sitting. I mean, when Christy first started coming, one time I'd see her sit over here, because everybody else sits in the same place every time, right? She'd sit over here, and then she'd sit over there, and then she'd it's like, what are you doing? She goes, I'm just trying to get to know people all, all over the church, you know? And if more of us would do that, and some of us are not quite as extroverted as she is, but uh, we would, we would there, there, there's so much richness, there's, there's so much uh, that's happening in the lives of people here that you could benefit from, or maybe they could benefit from you. Uh, and so I encourage you to do that, as she talked about today. Today's an easy time when we have the potluck. Just sit with people you don't know. Sit with some people that you don't quite know yet and get to know them a little bit, and you, you just never know what great stuff might, might come from it. And we have some people that are newer to the church, and, and they don't know very many people. They haven't been here 10 years, you know, and so they need some people to kind of, you know, pull them in and, and help them to feel a part of, a, our, of our church family. All right, I want to thank Terry, I want to thank Christy, I want to thank uh, Jason and Kelly and uh, for being willing to share their seeker stories today. Let's hear it for the, all those guys one more time. Cause it's... <laughs> Getting up and speaking uh, before a crowd is one of the scariest things they say for most people. And when you're sharing a really important part of your life, that, that can even be more scary. So I appreciate you all doing that. Why don't we stand? We're going to have our closing prayer. We'll pray for the meal. And if you can, stick around. doesn't matter if you brought food or not. Uh, there's always plenty. So stick around if you'd like to and enjoy the potluck and maybe sit with somebody you don't know. Lord, today we've been reminded of how when we see other people, we just see the tip of the iceberg. And Lord, sometimes when we're quick to judge or we're quick to be too busy or we're quick to think that we have it harder than anybody else, sometimes we need to be reminded uh, that reality is often different. All of us here have so many things to be thankful for. We're thankful for the progress that Katie has experienced and we thank you for the love of their family. We thank you for bringing Christy and her mom here and we could be here at a time when they have a greater need than than usual 
We thank you for people like Terry and what she's meant to our church and, and uh, we would be able to try to fill in a little bit uh, around the edges of her life and stuff that now that Max is gone. Oh, Lord, we're, you know, some of us have wonderful families outside of this place and others of us don't have much. There's, there's not that support. And so, God, I'm thankful that you created the church to be like not only a team that's on a mission together, but also a family that's in life together. And we thank you for each of these folks that got up and shared from their hearts today. Lord, we thank you for the food that we're about to enjoy and, and share, and, and we thank you that you provide for us so generously in every way. Pray that you'll bless it and bless this time that we have to uh, hang out together and get to know each other better. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming today, everybody. Stick around if you can. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.